What's up guys, it's Dull Matter here, and today we are going to be reacting to a new channel. So this is The Historian's Craft. I have seen his channel before, but I don't think I've ever reacted to it. Um, so people said I should check out this video, which I think is really interesting. It's, when did the Romans think Rome fell? Now, this is obviously interesting in the sense of, you know, what exactly do you mean by Roman, right? Because obviously at the height of the Roman Empire, they controlled a lot of stuff that by the time you get to, you know, Byzantium, what most people call Byzantium, is actually the Roman Empire. They don't control for the last, you know, thousand years, basically, of their history. Um, <clears throat> so, for people in the East and the West, it's going to be a completely different answer. And I'm more interested in the Western answer, uh, because the East is pretty obvious that it fell, you know, the end of the actual empire when it was conquered by the Turks, um, you know, it, it's over, right? At that point, it's over. So for the West, I find it interesting because obviously you had this whole weird situation for the longest time where, um, you know, there were, there was like competing claims and like Charlemagne and all of that stuff. So yeah, I kind of wonder like when did the Westerners finally realize they weren't in Rome anymore? So anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. When did the Roman Empire fall? You will get different answers depending on how the historian you're asking is thinking about the question and what exactly a fall entails. But when did the Roman... When did the fall entails, I guess, that one you can kind of interpret, right? Like, do you consider the fall the start of the decline or when it actually is just fully no longer existing? Um, however, like, this idea that, like, Rome fell when the West fell, I think it's just absolute, like, ridiculous Western cope. Um, oh, Territorial Zenith 117. I just think the Roman Empire fell. After all, the Western Empire collapsed in the 5th century, but the Empire survived in the East until 1453. Yeah. But the former Western territories were lost. So at some point, they must have thought something about all of this. Right? The first 75 years of the 5th century were beyond devastating for the Western Roman Empire. In 400, despite setbacks, things seemed to be fairly alright, but by 475 the Western Empire was reduced to Italy and some other holdings, but we should not think of this as being a rump state far from it. As the historian Edward Watts points out in his book The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, if the Western Empire of 475 were around today, it would be one of the largest countries in Europe, comprising Italy, most of Sicily, and a fair amount of what used to be Yugoslavia. The next year, infamously, Romulus Augustulus was deposed and the imperial regalia was sent to Constantinople, capital of the Eastern Empire. From a political perspective... One thing I find fascinating is how the, the start of Rome in the West, right, Starts with Romulus, ends with Romulus. The start of Rome in the East starts with Constantine, ends with Constantine. I always found that so fascinating. Perspective, the Western Empire was gone. But with the exception of a handful of aristocrats, no one appears to have really noticed. Over the next 60 years or so, there was a serious recovery in Italy under the Ostrogothic Kingdom which replaced Odoacer's kingdom, and primary sources speak of filth being washed from Italy under the care of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths. And he was actively compared by Italian senators and elites to Cato, one of the greatest statesmen of the Roman Republic. He was also compared to Trajan and Valentinian, and eventually he was compared to Alexander the Great. <laughs> and he asked the Eastern Emperor for the imperial regalia to be returned to him. To the Romans living in Ostrogothic Italy, we have very strong evidence that they considered themselves to be living in the Roman Empire still. That, that's interesting. What did the Ostrogothic Kingdom call itself? Like, obviously we call it the Ostrogothic Kingdom, but did they call themselves Romans? Or, I mean, uh, it seems like the general populace did. It was just a portion which was under the control of a client king to the Roman Empire based in Constantinople, and many living in the actual Roman Empire felt the same way. In other words, in about 500, there was very little notion that Rome had fallen. The same thing applied to the Visigoths in Spain and the Vandals in North Africa. Sure, the political makeup of the Roman Empire might look a bit different, but the majority of the people and political players considered themselves to be living in the res publica, the public thing, the Roman conception of what the state was. 
and they gave at least lip service to the emperor. Under Theodoric's direction, working in theory under the Roman emperors, his kingdom expanded to the banks of the Danube, southern Gaul, and he created a protectorate in Spain. One could possibly be forgiven for thinking much of anything had really changed. Enodius of Pavia praised him for restoring the Roman Empire to its former boundary and returning the culture of Rome's ancestors to the land. And yet, a century later, that sentiment was gone, replaced by the idea that something had changed. So, what happened? Well, in 527, the Roman Empire got a new emperor, Justinian. And with him came the crystallization of an idea that had been floating around Constantinople. We often think of Rome falling in 476 because Romulus Augustulus was deposed, but this is actually wrong, and I mean that literally. When the Roman Senate and Walker, the general who deposed Romulus, sent the imperial regalia back to the Emperor Zeno in Constantinople, the letter they sent with it stated that this was not a breakaway territory, it's just that two emperors were not needed anymore. The actual text states that there was no need of a divided rule and that one shared emperor was sufficient for both territories. Oh, so basically he is like demoting himself then, right? He's like, ah, I'm, not, I'm not an emperor anymore. I'm just a king. I'm a client king. That's interesting. I actually did not know that. That is interesting. Odoaka would serve as a representative of Constantinople. When Constantinople sent Theodoric back that regalia, the Roman government was telling him that he was an emperor in function if not in name. When we read sources written in Constantinople during this period which discuss Italy, they do not discuss it in terms of a fall. It was instead restored, and Theodoric was leading a Roman revival. In fact, this was a major cornerstone of his reign, and it's what makes the Ostrogoths so fascinating. But then, along came Justinian. Justinian's imperial project, to give a shorthand to his entire reign, was based not around reconquest as we sometimes think of it, but around a renovatio imperii romanorum, the renewal of the empire of the Romans. There was one reference to the idea that Rome had fallen in 476, written before about 500, and it comes from a religious polemic against Pope Leo written by Timothy, Bishop of Alexandria, in 477, but this did not really convince anybody. The historian Zosimus then wrote around 500 that the West had been lost, but again this didn't really convince anybody. Justinian's imperial project was based around three things, law, building, and religion. It was his belief that a Christian emperor had specific obligations to the empire, which was, in the language of imperial Christian propaganda, all part of God's divine plan. So therefore, the Roman Empire could not have fallen in 476, God would not have allowed that. But, he did think that there was an interruption caused by the barbarians. In 527, when Justinian took power as a divine emperor, as he saw it, a Roman count, Marcellinus, wrote the following. Odoacer, king of the Goths, took control of Rome. Odoacer slew Orestes right there. Odoacer condemned Augustulus, the son of Orestes, with the penalty of exile in Lucalanum a fortress in the Campania. The Western Empire of the Roman people, which the first Emperor Octavian Augustus had begun to rule in the 709th year from the foundation of the city, perished with this Augustulus. This was a novel argument which took notions about an idealized past which had been swirling around the intellectual and political scene in Constantinople since about 510, and basically put it on steroids. When Justinian looked so basically they're they're almost like retconning history to suit their current political goals right because the both the Germanic you know warriors that established these kingdoms view themselves as client states and the emperor views them as client states and they all view themselves to be within the Roman Empire but the, the kind of I don't know what you would call it. Like, I guess, like, the, the intelligentsia and the elite around Constantinople start to change their view on this, and then the, so they kind of, like, retcon history to fit their political agenda. Is that basically what's happening here? Am I summarizing that correctly? West. This now was what he saw. Marcellinus eventually became Justinian's secretary, and he gave his emperor a useful tool, because he stated that Odoacu was a goth. But he was not a goth. He was Herulian, maybe, or Scyrian, we don't actually know. There's one argument that he was maybe a Thuringian, but he definitely was not a Goth. 
what Theodoric was, and in Marcellinus we begin to see outlines of the idea that the Goths had taken down Rome. That was not the political or cultural reality, though, but it didn't matter, because in this new political context, if the reality of the world did not reflect the ideals, then the reality of the world would be changed to reflect those ideals. This, right here, is why we learn in textbooks about Rome falling in 476. It is literally Roman propaganda about Rome itself. <laughs> when a friendly Vandal king was deposed... It, it's kind of weird, though. Like, the, the way they frame this, like, like, the way the Romans frame this, literally sheds territory from the Empire. Right? It, it's all... I don't really know know how to what to compare this to like in terms of anything, but it's like they 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 obviously have declined, right? That's undeniable. But in order to I guess like return to what they used to be, they basically say this decline was much worse than it actually was. Um, well, I get, you can get in debate there, but they basically you know say it was much more. I don't know if aggressive is the right word either, but. Uh, you know, these states had actually split off already and were their own state. And therefore, because they're their own state, we can go reconquer them, even though technically it's part of it. It's almost like this weird thing where, like, you're declaring a civil war, but acting as if it's not a civil war because these people had already conquered you, even though it's... It, it's so weird. It, it's, it's smart and weird at the same time. And the friendly Gothic queen was killed. The mental gymnastics The justifications for, for arguing that these ideas that the barbarians had destroyed, some idealized notion of the Roman state and that their non-Orthodox brand of Christianity were corrupting what was supposed to be a divine state, were now there. For 20 years or so, Roman armies invaded North Africa and Italy in an attempt to restore the Roman Empire to its former state, and the Romans backed one faction in a political crisis in Visigothic Spain. With victories on the battlefield, Justinian's Renovatio would now be more than just an idea in his imagination. That renewal extended also to laws and to religion and to building, because in Justinian's mind, it mattered what one did and what one believed. It mattered a great deal to be orthodox. His law code, the Corpus Juris Civilis, attempted to study Roman law in depth and remove inconsistencies and iron out legal precedent and solve long-standing problems. In this way, Justinian removed every inconsistency from what he saw as laws which were backed by the power of heaven. His laws were designed to create a more uniform Roman Empire to better carry out God's divine plan for the Roman state on earth, and now that it was restored, God's plan could be carried out. Although it's now that it's so restored, but he never did fully restore the empire. Right? After 117, with I believe it was Trajan that was in charge, it never reached the zenith again. Those who were still pagan lost their civil service jobs in 529, and Justinian launched persecutions of pagans and heretical Christians in the empire, and some were even exiled, or worse, killed. In matters of construction, Justinian spent untold sums on everything from fortifications to aqueducts to roadways to stadiums, but dominating it all was the great temple of the Hagia Sophia, designed to be grander than the first temple of the Jews described in the Old Testament. Why is Hagia Sophia this and not this? Whenever I see that, I, whenever I see the Hagia Sophia, I always think of the average Turk versus Greek debate. Indeed, one source records Justinian as he stepped through the finished doorway of the temple, saying, "Solomon, I have outdone thee." Man, I, I, I'm surprised that like he would say that because wouldn't that be like considered sacrilege? I mean, it's, it is obviously true, right, that's better than anything that would have been created, like, way back in the day, but it's also probably sacrilegious. The price for his imperial project, however, were the lives of hundreds of thousands, a battered economy, and the plague of Justinian, now confirmed in 2013 to indeed be the bubonic plague, and the bizarre weather of 535 and 536, during which the sun was covered by a dust veil and the temperature cooled by at least two degrees, left an empire which was militarily conquered. I mean, you can't really blame this on him. Or, um, you definitely can't blame the weather on him. The plague, it, it's, I mean, with the technology of the time, you can't really blame that on him either. That was just going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, the economy, you can to a certain degree, depending on how much these two factors played into that. But obviously the war, you can definitely blame on him. But otherwise devastated, it produced an intellectual shift as well, 
as there were now two distinct Roman empires. The first empire, which had dispatched Theodoric to Italy in the first place and with which many of the successor kingdoms understood themselves to be broadly operating, was gone. Justinian's wars left their mark in a piece of writing, the Varii of Cassiodorus, a Roman living in Theodoric's kingdom, who had to grapple with a disturbing idea. If the Goths and the Romans were living in the Roman Empire, as people in Ostrogothic Italy thought they were and as people living in Constantinople prior to 527 thought they were, then why were the Romans coming to conquer them? It made no sense to people at the time. Justinian's imperial project forced people all over the empire to shift their thinking. Just who and what was Roman and what was not? Sure, many Goths were ethnically Gothic, but they had lived within the borders of Rome for multiple generations, and we have tombstones of Frankish soldiers which state that those buried beneath them were Franks by birth, but Romans in life and Romans in death. Besides, the Emperor Justinian himself was from some backwater little village in the mountains of what is today Macedonia. To blue-blooded Roman aristocrats who could trace their ancestry back centuries, Justinian was little more than a poorly educated hick. The Roman Empire which emerged after his reign was a Roman Empire in which the Roman identity had been disrupted and broken. What mattered now wasn't necessarily some shared history, but notions of religious orthodoxy and legality proven by success in all things imperial. Of course, it also backfired on Justinian because by declaring war on a kingdom which saw itself as fundamentally a part of the Roman world, indeed as a copy of the only empire, to quote a letter sent by Theodoric to the Emperor Zeno, Justinian opened up European politics to the possibility of having a state describe itself as Roman, only to have another self-described Roman state declare that essentially, you're not Rome, I'm Rome. And it's a pro It also opens up politics in the sense that so many of these, right, like the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, all these people think that they're Roman, and they... Because of that, even though they technically control these kingdoms, they view themselves as client states or as, you know, um, states within a state or, you know, I guess the, t the idea of a state didn't really exist at the time, but, um, you know, a, a civil, whatever you want to call it, right? And now all of a sudden they're granted full independence so that he can justify war on them to conquer them, which <laughs> it's like, it's such a dumb idea, but like, it really does, like, so much of history changes like the way that history has to play out now changes because of this idea process which has never really stopped some time ago i released a video examining byzantine historiography and why professionals use the term and if it is indeed useful the comments were full of people decrying its use if you want to know why that's still a debate look no further than the reign of justinian after his decades-long war and the devastation of plague surveying the wreckage, especially in an Italy where people are difficult to come by archaeologically after about 530, one perhaps wonders if Justinian did indeed realize that his secretary Marcellinus was correct after all. Rome did fall, but he got the date wrong. Yeah, man, it's, it's kind of funny because Justinian is like somewhat, you know, kind of in a way because of the way he framed history. Uh, he's remembered as like one of the better Byzantine emperors, but it realistic. If you look at it like more, I guess like objectively, if you look at like the way that he framed it in this video, he really wasn't right. Like he he conquered all of this territory, but it was territory that he literally threw away to conquer. Uh, it's such a weird thing. Um, although he did, again, it didn't really answer. Like, I mean, it kind of answered it in some ways, right? It more so, when did you know, it was, he did answer it in some ways, but not in other ways. Like, I wonder, like, the people of, like, modern-day France, when did they stop viewing themselves as Roman? The people of, uh, you know, Britain, I'm guessing, well, Britain's pretty obvious, it's when the Anglo-Saxons conquered them, right? But uh, France is different, where, you know, they assimilated to the Latin language, right? Obviously, you know, they call themselves the French, right, which obviously comes from the Franks, but they still speak a, uh, you know, they don't speak a Germanic language. Um, that would be a very interesting one, but anyway, that was a lot of information I didn't know and really weird. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think below, like, comment, subscribe, I'll see you guys in the next one.